portion of Paul's letter to the Philippians, inspired by God, speaking about the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The freedom to live and to hold on to a life worth living. The Apostle Paul picks up here in verse 7 as he follows a section in which he talks about all the things as he looks back in his life that were worthless, that did not accomplish anything. And here says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. And so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Now that I, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. This is the Word of God. As I said at the beginning of the reading, the Apostle Paul here is contemplating his life before knowing the promise of complete forgiveness in Jesus Christ, the holiness and perfection that is credited to him through faith in Jesus Christ, comparing that life before and his life now. He looks back and he, he says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Something that was important, something that was valuable, really was something that kept me from Christ, something that was lost. Now I consider it just something that can be done away with for the sake of Christ. He emphasizes that even more as he says in verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And then he just, with emphasis, and enthusiasm, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. And then the comma expresses, but then a pause and says, lest anyone misunderstand me. Lest anyone misunderstand and think that I'm talking about somehow gaining that holiness, that righteousness that is mine in Jesus Christ already. He then throws in the phrase just to clarify that he's talking about living his Christian life, striving to honor God in this world. He says, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, not being innocent and holy in God's eyes because of all the things I've done and all the promises I've kept, but that which is through faith in Christ, that which is mine as I trust in what Christ did for me, the righteousness that comes from God on the, basis of, on the basis of faith. I'm talking about a righteous way of living. You see, what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's living in his faith. I'm already forgiven. I'm already holy. Eternal glory, the nth degree of glory, is already promised to be mine because of what Christ did for me. So now what do I do? Do I go back and do the things that I used to do? What about the things that I'm dealing with right now? What about the temptations of my sinful flesh? What about the options that the world has for me to offer? I've got to sort this all out. 
You see, that's what we as Christians, that's what Christians throughout the centuries, that's what all people who trust in Jesus Christ, when they take a look at their life and they're grabbing on to life, they now know what's valuable. They know what they can trust in. They know it is the Lord. They know what the Lord has done for them. And now they've got to sort out how they take that truth that they trust in and apply it to their life. And it is like sorting things out. The Apostle Paul makes references that something that I used to think was valuable, now I see it as garbage. And conversely, perhaps something that he thought was well, literally something that he thought was worthless, namely the message of Jesus Christ. He thought not only was it worthless, but he thought it was dangerous. Now he considers it to be of the greatest value to him. Sorting out the garbage from what has true value. Sorting out in our lives what should be kept and what should be tossed. That's what Christians do. I don't have a physical image or picture to show you, but I can tell you a little story. A couple weeks ago when I was back taking care of my mom's house, in the closet in my old bedroom were two cardboard boxes that were filled with stuff, let's see, probably from around anywhere from the years 1978 to about 1985 or so. There was all sorts of stuff in those boxes, two boxes. And when my wife, Leslie, pulled it out of the closet because we were doing this to the whole house, she looked at it and she immediately put it, she goes, you got to sort this stuff out. And I found the boxes were filled with all sorts of things. There were like ticket stubs. To, or there was a, actually there was a, if I remember right, one example, there was a program from a track meet in Iowa from my high school days. And there were all sorts of things. And I looked at it, and for some reason, long, long time ago, I thought it was of value. And I put it in that box and I kept it. I took a picture of a couple of things, namely my artwork that my kids like to see because they just go, Dad, you have absolutely no talent. You never did and you don't have any talent now with artwork. And I found all sorts of stuff that at one time I thought was valuable and I kept it. But when push came to shove, when it was time to condense stuff, when it was time to decide what's going to get packed away and move to Nebraska and eventually make Idaho and so on, there was a whole bunch of stuff that I pulled out like that track meet program. Okay, that was neat, nice memory in the garbage. It's just not worth holding on to. There were a few things that I pulled out. Oh, couldn't believe it. It was kind of embarrassing. I'm not going to ever let my kids see it, but my mom had kept some of my report cards from grade school. <laughs> Howard needs lots of help. Pause in everything. No. Um, all sorts of things. And yeah, that was maybe worth keeping. Oh, and then there were some precious things. I found some snapshots that I hadn't seen in years of one particular snapshot of Leslie and I, just before we went out on our first formal dress-up, go-out-to-eat date, that was kind of fun. I secretly snuck that one into my pocket and then gave it to her when I got home. You see, there's some things that are of value, and there's some things that at one time you think is valuable, but when you look at it from a new light or when you look at it from a different perspective, you go, it's just not worth holding on to. I think all of us can see what Paul is talking about when he looked at, you know, all those things I did before I trusted in Jesus for my perfection, all those things when I was trusting in myself, all those rules, all those little habits, all those things that I was taught as a Pharisee I had to do to somehow earn God's pleasure. If they don't truly glorify God, if they don't truly help my neighbor, what I used to think was valuable is now garbage. And what I used to think was garbage 
like taking time to be patient with someone. Being like Christ who the Pharisee said, I can't believe he's hanging out with those people to tell them about his love. They're the disgusting people who aren't good enough for us. What I used to think was garbage, now I hold as precious because I now see what Christ has done for me. And I see that it was precious to Him. And because spending time with those people was precious to Him, now it's precious to me. And I can't go through a list for your lives I can kind of guess because we all have some common temptations. We all have some common denominators, so to speak. But you, we as Christians, knowing that we are completely forgiven, that eternal glory is ours, purchased already, as we look at our lives, we are constantly confronted as we grab on to that life, opportunities and situations that we have to sort things out. What truly is important. Not from what the world says is important. The world may say winning the game at all cost is what's important. A Christian says, using my skills and abilities to my nth degree for the glory of God has value, but cheating, lying, and striving to harm someone else has no place in my life. I'm going to throw out the garbage and hold on to what's good. Providing for my family so that they have the best of everything, so that they are the the sharpest dressed kids in the school, so that they have the latest toys, so that our families go on the greatest vacations, that's what's important. Well, maybe bits and pieces of that can be accomplished, but truly what's important first and foremost is that my children know who Jesus is. That they know what He has done for them. And that they are trained and equipped by me and my fellow Christians to boldly confess their faith, honoring God and witnessing that truth to others. Not only with their words, but also with their actions. Saving as many pennies, dimes, dollars, and municipal bonds as possible to make sure that my retirement account, that is first and foremost in my life. And anything that would dare get in the way of that needs to go. But now as I think about what Christ has given me and how He gave Himself for me, First of all, budgeting a line item that says, my gift to God. All of a sudden becomes valuable. And putting those other things first are garbage. Not to mention that more ways, more times than not, the Lord often blesses us so much, maybe not in the way we think, but that He ends up giving us both. What's important? What gets thrown out? What do we keep? God's love for us moves us, gives us the motivation, and God's Word also guides us. As we take a look at the text again, Paul expresses that desire to sort things out in verse 10 when he says, I want to know Christ. Here he's not speaking about knowing Christ as his Savior, not speaking about trusting in Jesus for forgiveness. He's already made that painfully, clear, very clearly, obviously stated it so that no one can miss this. What he says is, I want to know. I want Christ in my life. I want to experience Christ. He says, yes, to know the power of his resurrection. That's what we've been talking about in Bible study. In baptism, dead to sin, alive in Christ. We're a new person. Even every moment, whenever we're feeling that pain of guilt and shame, and God comes to us again and says, hey, remember, I've forgiven you already. It's like being brought back to life. 
I want to know that. I want to experience that every single moment of my life. Anytime there's the pain of doubt, anytime there's the pain of fear, anytime there's that pain of, am I good enough for God? He comes to me with His love, and I want to know that. I want that every day. And then the next one, though. I want to know the power of His resurrection and, the part, and participation in His sufferings. This one doesn't automatically, immediately make as much sense. In fact, this is one of those options where the world says, suffering? That's garbage. Get rid of it. And a Christian says, participation in His suffering is valuable. Well, what type of suffering is valuable? Well, what type of suffering was valuable to Jesus Himself? The ultimate sufferer. Why did He suffer? Because He was just thinking about Himself and thought it would be a kick? No. No. Father, thy will be done, not mine, but thy will be done. Because he was doing it, he willingly suffered for us because he loved us. What was number one in his life? Us. What was number one in his purpose for suffering? The whole world. And that's how a Christian sorts out something of value from garbage and says suffering is worthwhile because they see suffering as an opportunity to serve for someone else. Yeah, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to, in a very small but practical way, I'm going to suffer a little bit because I'm going to take and give up what would be comfortable for me of sitting in Bible study and having fun with my friends. I'm going to suffer a little bit by helping out with Sunday school. And yes, I always use these examples at the end of summer just before this term is going to start while we're still looking for as many volunteers as possible. Yeah, I'm going to willingly suffer. This is valuable to me. I could sit at home and watch a movie. I could sit at home and, and just, just relax at the end of the day. Or I could get something useful done like mowing the lawn or fixing the sink or whatever. But I'm going to suffer with the reality that I'm just going to have to find other times to do that. It needs to be done because I'm taking time right now to come to church. I'm taking time to sit down and read my Bible. I'm taking time to log in online and join in Tuesday night Bible study. I'm taking time maybe to go out and to visit my neighbor who's struggling and tell them about Jesus. The world would say, throw that out. Why inconvenience yourself? Why put, make your life more difficult? Why suffer in that way? But we as Christians desire to participate in such suffering as we are moved and desire to love others as Christ has loved us. Becoming like Him in His death giving our all, giving our focus, giving our entire being to God's will in our life, to the glory of God's name in everything we do for the sake of others. Now, if any of you are feeling guilty at this moment because, you know, pastor's right, but I haven't really done very good at that. I haven't really attained it to the level that I'd like to attain it. Well, once again, we go full circle whenever we're feeling that guilt and remember, uh, Christ already died for our imperfections. Trust in Him. His holiness is credited to you right now. So tell those feelings of guilt to be quiet. And as Paul brings out at the end, don't misunderstand me or the Apostle Paul or any of us. The Apostle Paul readily admits, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. And as Pastor Mulkey says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal 
or that I could say all the members and friends, family and friends of Messiah, not that they have obtained all this or have already arrived at this goal, but, Paul says, I press on. Pastor Mulkey says, I press on. And we as a Christian congregation made of individuals and families say, we press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me or us. Christ took hold of us, redeemed us, bought us back, paid for our guilt, gave us His holiness, and made us His people so that we could strive to take hold of life. Knowing what is truly of value, knowing for certain that His promises are what we can trust in, what we can stand on, and those promises and those truths will never disappoint us. So that when we take a moment and look at our lives and we have to make decisions, we recognize what's truly garbage and we get rid of it. And we hold on to what has true value. Either sustaining us in our faith, encouraging us in our faith, or giving us opportunities to express and share our faith. My dear friends in Christ, let us hold on to life. Let us reach out and hold on to it with the power God has given us. Always trusting in the Lord who is of greatest value as He leads us, guides us, equips us to constantly sort out what is truly valuable and get rid of the garbage that only harms us, is not needed, and serves no purpose. Amen. We continue at this moment as I see the youngsters of the kids' church ready to join.